Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 59 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest is Henry Schlesinger, an author who has written frequently about intelligence and national security topics over the years. I've got three of his books on my bookshelf. In fact, the first and one I've mentioned many times here in the past is Spycraft, which he co-authored with Keith Melton and Robert Wallace. I've also got Spy Sites of Washington, D.C., which is a terrific guide to some of the real world locations in the D.C. area where acts of espionage have occurred. I've taken several trips into the city myself just to see some of these sites with my own eyes. And now I've added a third book of his to my collection, one which I invited him onto the podcast to discuss. It's called Honey Trapped, Sex, Betrayal, and Weaponized Love. I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you that sex, love, and all the poor judgment that accompany both of those have been a factor in espionage operations for practically all of history. Henry's written an amazing book covering dozens of true stories of how sex was employed by, for, or against spies and their targets. But first, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Cameron W. and Matthew S., your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Henry, thank you for taking the time for this interview. I've been looking forward to this. Oh. Pleased to be here. Great, great. You know, I have to tell you, I've read a lot of books on espionage history over the past couple of years, but I was amazed at how densely packed Honey Trapped was with so many different stories over so many different eras. In fact, there were a lot there that I was not familiar with. I would say over half of those stories were new to me, which was a surprise considering how much reading I've done. So I have to ask, how long have you been researching and writing this book? The book took about two years to write. A lot of the research was done in writing the other books. I was able to pull instances and you know, incidences out of you know, other material that I've written about previously. Mm. Yeah, that's, I'm sure that's a huge help for certain. You've, how long have you been writing, writing on these topics in general? How many years since you started in this field? Probably a little more than 20. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sure that you have quite a lot that could you could contribute to this book in that case. Yeah. So right from the start, right in the prologue, there's this particularly amazing example of the consequences of a sex scandal, an engineered sex scandal, right at the beginning. So how did one of these sex scandals impact Vladimir Putin's rise to power at the turn of this millennium? Well, what he did was he used a sex scandal in service to Yeltsin, his predecessor. Or, or he was allegedly used a sex scandal in service to Yeltsin's predecessor, which eased the way to power. It was a very smart move, a wily move. In reporting the scandal on television, he reported it as you would any other piece of news. He wasn't embarrassed. He just laid out the facts as he saw them or as he wanted to present them and um, let the audience make up their mind. He was, and that was the first time a lot of Russians saw him on television. That was their introduction to Putin on television. Hmm. And he was, yeah, he was professional. He was calm. He was well-dressed and well-mannered. He looked like a, you know, he didn't look like the old apparatchiks. He looked like a new Russian. So, it, I mean, would you describe it as not just an opportunity for him, but a, like a, a media, flash, I guess. It was a media event, and it was also allegedly a very strategic move for him. Yeah, it seems so, because, I mean, one of the, I mean, obviously he rose to power, and he's, and he's been there for well over 20 years now. I mean, would you describe this as one of the deciding factors, or was it just another, you know, tool that he had at his disposal around that time? It was another tool. 
Okay, yeah, I mean, he's uh, employed a lot of them over the years, it certainly appears. Sure. He's allegedly, they also indulge in, you know, assassinations and murders overseas. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. We, we've covered some of that stuff in the past year on the, on the podcast, but there's still so much more to go over. It's, it's such a, a deep history. So this particular scandal, if I recall correctly, he was able to blackmail a, a state prosecutor that was going after Yeltsin. And if I got that right, or am I mis- Right, it was Yeltsin and his family. And they were investigating a misappropriation of funds or funds funneled through, you know, as, um, a, bri- a bribery. It would have been a bribery scandal at the end of the day. It overwhelmed the money scandal, the sex scandal did. And it effectively removed the prosecutor from the case and discouraged other prosecutors from taking it up. Hmm. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And that's exactly the kind of thing that would overwhelm a story that, you know, would cause people to, or people wouldn't understand that as well, you know, money moving around, that sort of thing. But it doesn't hold your attention as well as something kind of titillating and, and right. scandalous like a, yeah. like a sex scandal is. Right. Probably the only thing that holds people's attention more than money is sex. Yeah, no doubt about it. So the book obviously is called Honey Trapped, but where did that, or how did that term come into existence in the first place? How did Honey Trap become associated with espionage, blackmail, you know, that sort of thing? Sure. Luck Carre takes credit for it. First using it in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Oh, wow. He wanted to create a vocabulary of espionage to add authenticity and to put the reader inside. So he, you know, thought up words like headhunter and that kind of thing. Okay. There were earlier instances in England of it being used in the criminal world. Really? So, the term or the, the strategy, you mean? The term. Okay. Honey, honey trap, there are instances of it being used in the criminal world. I suspect that La Carre's close association with the criminal world, he just sort of transferred it, maybe even not knowing so. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I see. So what exactly is a honey trap? I think we all have an idea, but, you know, as I read through your book, I saw that there were a a lot of ways that, you know, seduction has kind of been incorporated as an end to various means. So what is a honey trap to you? A honey trap is using sex or the promise of sex or, or the claim of sex to meet an operational goal. And that might be cooperation, that might be eliminating a person from the picture through scandal, that might be a, the beginning of, that might be the stick that, be, you know, that begins the cooperation and it ends with money, which has happened frequently. Mm, yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And would you say, because you cover stories across many different periods of time, and of course, all across the world, are they kind of typically employed in basically the same ways or do, you know, different cultures, different countries, different agencies put their own spin on it? Honey traps are employed in virtually every intelligence agency throughout time, dating back to the biblical era, or, you know, intelligence personnel dating back to the biblical era, probably before. There are a large number of variations to them. For instance, if you, if you ask the average person on the street, what's a honey trap? They might tell you that it's two guys jumping out of a closet with cameras to catch people in bed. Someone else might tell you it's a seduction where their target whispers secrets over pillow talk or it might, you know, or other forms of blackmail. In reality, there are dozens of iterations of the technique that consistently update along with the technology that's introduced. For instance, photography, film, hidden cameras, that kind of thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, you can you can get a lot of stuff remotely now, even with the promise of sex, I would say, which I'm sure. sure we'll get into later on as we go through this. So because just like we mentioned a minute ago, you know, these obviously catch the eye of the public and of individuals as well and kind of keep our attention because they're so, you know, lurid and scandalous and, and all that. Typically, did you find that there was a lot of like hyperbole and exaggeration and falsification around these stories? I mean, were you able to pretty consistently like separate fact from fiction as you went through the research for this book? There's a lot of mythology surrounding them. I think probably most likely the, you know, the so-called sex schools in Russia is part of the mythology. You know, it's difficult to separate the mythology from the, the, the history in a lot of cases, particularly when you go way far back, but they all pretty much, you know, conform to the one of the established scripts across cultures if you go back to ancient sanskrit they advise that you use actresses or singers 
for honey traps. And that was true well into the 20th century and probably wow. 21st century. Wow, from ancient Sanskrit all the way to the 20th century, some things aren't changing at all, huh? That's amazing. No, not at all. And um, many of the um, strategies or the techniques laid out in the ancient Sanskrit have been used, you know, well into the 20th century. Hmm. You know, the, I, yeah, the idea of luring somebody out of a bar to a remote location with a promise of sex and then, you know, killing them or kidnapping them, that was in the Sanskrit, and that's used today as well. Oh, wow. So since you mentioned Sanskrit, what is the earliest example of a honey trap that you were able to find? Um, probably biblical, the Old Testament. Samson, did all, that's pretty old. Um, the, Epic of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that's also pretty old. It's just, a, you know, a little far, you know, a little more recent, like a couple of thousand years, I guess. But I would assume they date back to before written history. Yeah, I, I would certainly imagine. I mean, hit, human nature being what it is, only some of it changes and some of it certainly does not, regardless of the time period. So speaking of ancient history, there was one story from ancient China that I would love to hear you tell again, if you don't mind. It's the story of Zixi and, and Fu Shai, I think it was. Right. Can you just right. tell us a little bit about that story? I know it's, you know, it's um, basically the, a legend at okay. this point, but very interesting. But the defeated king wanted revenge on, you know, the victor. And the way he went about it was to find the most beautiful woman in, the, in his country. And the thing that makes it interesting is that she was schooled before, before given over as tribute to the, the victorious king. She was schooled in the social graces and singing and that kind of thing. The king became so obsessed with her, he not only ne neglected his duties as king, but he undertook a series of um, enormous programs to please her. Um, large palace, palaces and a uh, canal and that kind of thing which caused what was what would be the correct word for that anxiousness in his nation mm. and left him vulnerable to attack. And he was eventually defeated and killed in combat. Oh, wow. So she, she weakened the entire, she weakened the entire like, nation. Yeah. They built canals so that she can go on pleasure cruises. They built a palace for her with earth and jugs underneath the floorboards that would resonate when she walked and create music. Um, very elaborate oh tribute to her. Um, he was just, a, you know, the king became obsessed with her. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, yeah, I guess he had practically unlimited resources to kind of honor and showcase her and all that. And that's what he used. Yeah. So, seems to have worked out better than anyone would have anticipated, I would guess. Right. She was, you know, she was essentially responsible for the downfall of the nation. Incredible. What time period was that exactly? I honestly don't know a whole lot about it. Oh, it slipped my mind. I'm sorry. It was B BC. Some BC. Point. Okay. Yeah. So 2000 plus years ago, yeah. the strategy was well established then. Oh yeah. So like I said, that was one of the most interesting things about the book was just seeing how, you know, time and time again, these strategies were effectively used throughout history. So I want to fast forward now a little bit to nearer history anyway. Like you had some sto interesting stories, like from the American revolution. For example, I know that, as you said, George Washington didn't really employ any honey trap operations that are documented, even not, though he was an extremely capable spy master. Uh, not but that we know, know of. Yeah, exactly, uh, that we know of, right, right. But there was one incident, I know it was like, like a big scandal that was somewhat manufactured. Anyway, so can you talk about that scandal that embroiled one of the founding fathers? You, you're referring to Hamilton? Yes. Yeah, the Hamilton scandal, was began as a typical blackmail scandal among you know thieves basically criminals a woman claimed that she needed money you know knocking on his door he gave her money an affair began her husband re-entered the picture conveniently and he began paying them off when political rivals years later got a hold of the information they threatened to use it against him hamilton being hamilton came clean and wrote a you know an unsparing account of the whole affair. It ended the scandal, but also probably ended his chances for the presidency as well. Hmm. Well, he, he was a very talented guy. I'll admit that I have not actually seen the musical that's been so popular the past few years, but I believe that she is one of the characters in the in the musical, right. isn't she? Right. Maria Reynolds, I believe she is. Maria I Reynolds. Music, right. I haven't seen okay. the musical either. He was pretty close. The musical is pretty historically accurate. Hmm. 
be hmm. based on Chernow's book, I imagine. You know. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it might be worth a watch. I mean, I, I really enjoy that type of history, but I wasn't haven't just made the time, you know, yeah. for the musical version of it yet. Yeah, Hamilton's life still has resonance today, particularly among a lot of immigrant groups. You know, he was a true believer in America. He was a hard worker. He was an immigrant himself. Um, so, you know, his life has real resonance. And the way he approached it, the way he approached the blackmail and the political scandal was just straight on. He didn't deny it. He didn't try to spin it. He just wrote a pamphlet detailing what had happened. Yeah, that's impressive to just use the truth as, I don't know if I call it a shield, maybe a shield and a sword, right. you know, to defend yourself sure. like that, like that radical honesty almost, yeah. which is what people wanted out of him in the first place, I suppose. Yeah. So he, yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, I, you have to wonder what he would have been like as a president, certainly, but it sounded like he mostly kind of survived that scandal. Yeah. His vision of America was much different than Jefferson's. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Hard to imagine now. Yeah. So fast forwarding a little bit to the, I guess, around the mid 1850s in Europe, uh, you wrote about this guy, Wilhelm Stiber. Stiber? Right. Right. Um, very interesting on... guy I was not familiar with. I'm definitely going to be reading a lot more about him. Can you talk about right. his honey trap operations? He began in the police department, police department, I believe. And he was interested in vice. He actually wrote an entire book on prostitution. The police department did an interesting thing, which was they collected funds from all of the working girls, you know, a payout, and then put it into a fund in case they needed money, which they would, you know, ostensibly pay out to them. What that did was that put the working girls under the control of the police and they became informal informants. Um, Stiber never forgot that. When he became the head of intelligence under Bismarck, he opened a brothel that was ostensible, you know, that was geared towards the upper crust and was a spy operation. And they kept track of everyone who came there. The girls were interviewed regularly on what the you know, the likes and dislikes of the clientele were. They kept detailed records of the vices. That was one of his operations. He, I guess he exported that to Japan and he exported it to Russia at one point. But he also kept tight control on the press and he kept tight control on, you know, a lot of things. He was very dictatorial. He basically ran a police state. Hmm. Yeah, the, the way that you wrote him, he was deeply unpopular with everyone. He was like a hated figure, but he was also tremendously capable within his realm. Right. So and, right. At one point, I believe the story goes, he enticed a relative, a close relative, a brother-in-law or an uncle to become part of a radical group and then arrested him and, along with the other radicals in order to gain points with Bismarck or whoever was in <laughs> at the time. Wow. He claimed to have gone into, I, bet, I think it was France, dressed as a peddler. And at night, he would peddle pornographic photos or pornographic drawings in the bars. And during the day, he would go around to the households and sell religious figurines and religious tokens. How true that story is, we don't know. Hmm. I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't put it above him. It no. doesn't sound like. No, he would claim that the pornographic drawings were done at a brothel in Berlin through a peephole and that kind of thing. I mean, he was, um, there's a lot of legends about him. There's, um, The Chancellor Spy is a book that came out a while ago, but it's a fraud. Right, The Chancellor Spy. It's basically taken from notes from other books and it's unreliable. So you have to be careful when researching. Them. Of course. Yeah, that's he's definitely someone I'm gonna be looking into. One question about him, this relief fund that you mentioned, was he using that fund as leverage against the, the girls that he wanted to recruit? Or was it just a way for him to, you know, have them coming to him to begin with and kind of establish rapport and assess them for their, you know, capability and all that? It was, it was a way to control them. And they knew that they could curry favor by informing on their clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. That, that's incredibly clever on his part. I mean, it's, you know, duplicitous and everything, but incredibly clever to figure out a way to control the entire network in his yeah. city like that. That's well, amazing stuff. And well, it is like a humanitarian effort. Right. It's a way to form a network, create a network. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. What a guy. I mean, it's, yeah, he'll, I'll definitely be reading up a lot more on him in the future. Before we go on, I want to let all of you listening know about a new educational tool you're not going to want to miss. It's the Gray Man Briefing Classified. By now, I think I know my listeners pretty well, and take it from me, this briefing is exactly the news and educational reference source that you've been looking for. 
You'll get breaking news updates from all over the world on topics including planned protests and riots, low intensity conflicts, natural disaster alerts, cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, and more. You'll also get access to articles that help you build your own skills, including urban survival, home security, counter surveillance, escape and evasion techniques, and more. And this is much more than just a newsletter in your inbox. Joining the Gray Man Briefing Classified also includes invitation-only channels on the Telegram and Signal apps for convenient real-time updates. The newsletter subscription is normally $5 per month, but if you use the code GBC Spycraft, you can save 20% each month for the life of your subscription. I'm already a member myself and have been reading and learning a lot since I first subscribed. Look it up yourself at graymanbriefing.com. That's gray with an A, graymanbriefing.com. And use the discount code GBC Spycraft to save 20% right from the start. So, Henry, the majority of your book covers 20th century and then early 21st century, of course, because those are certainly the, the best documented eras, I would say. And there's just so much in that that it was hard to choose what I really wanted to talk about. Kind of, there's so much material there that we could go over for hours and hours, I think. But one of the most interesting stories of all, to me, one of the most unexpected was this investigation that ended up involving Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, as kind of an accomplice to the investigation. Can you tell us what happened there exactly? There, there was a woman, she was from New York, and she went down to Washington during the war, very wealthy woman. And she, I guess she attracted the ire of the society ladies down in Washington. And she, was a, she had a German surname. And I said, and she was accused of being a spy. Well, Roosevelt's daughter, who was colorful effort with her, with, with this woman and, you know, some well-placed men, what she, you know, revealed was, you know, it was just ridiculous. There was fellow talk about locomotives being shipped to Europe and that kind of thing during the First World War. Um, it was um, mostly gossip, but the gossip was enough to drive this woman back to New York City. Hmm. So the investigation really occurred, but Al, do you think that Alice kind of exaggerated her role in it or played it up sort of, or was she really involved deeply? Alice, I think, played it up to a large extent. She was, you know, she was eccentric. At one point, I think Teddy Roosevelt said, I can either run the country or take care of Alice. I can't do both. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there was, I don't think of Teddy Roosevelt as a guy who is, couldn't handle a situation. So that yeah. uh, Alice must yeah. have been quite a handful if he was right, something yeah. like that. Yeah, she required a lot of attention, oh, um, my gosh. right? And she was, I, I, I believe she was involved with one of the Brits and, you know, or the, you know, she, you know, she was, you know, she inserted herself in international affairs. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, they certainly would have been happening all around her at that right. time. Her father's a president, so can see how that would happen. So one of the most famous cases of all, the, the one that I see everywhere when we talk about this kind of stuff is Mata Hari herself. And so you talked about that extensively. And from reading your book, it, it sounds like she was, you know, kind of nothing what most people would expect when they've only vaguely heard about her. So can you kind of give us the real rundown on what her career as a spy was, like who she was, where she came from, and what she did or, you know, did not accomplish? She was a middle-class woman from Holland. She married an officer and shipped overseas, and it wasn't the marriage that, you know, she had anticipated. It was, you know, he had put an ad in the paper and she responded. She responded with a photograph. She was the only one to do so, I believe. You know, he, very early on, he infected her with syphilis. The two she had two children. One, the boy died when he was mistreated for the um, for, for syphilis with mercury. They gave an overdose of mercury at the base hospital. And there was over the little girl. She went to Paris the first time, couldn't find employment, and worked in a very low-level brothel, where she was expected to service between 10 and 12 or 15 men on the, the ship for very little money. Went back to Holland, borrowed some money, and went back to Paris and was was able to make it into, you know, somewhat society and gained a reputation as a dancer and built this persona, you know, as an exotic dancer. Mostly it was her taking her clothes off for elites, very rich people, you know, and then it was built from there. And she was promoted as an exotic dancer who took her clothes off, but you could feel good about it because it was cultural. It was culturally enriching. Um, Towards the end of her career, she tried to spy. 
She took money from the French and the Germans, did very little for both. The German who she was having an affair with sent a code that had already been broken that more or less identified. You know, she spied for both for money. You know, she, she was down on her luck at that point. And the French captured her. And she was a very good publicity, you know, very good propaganda tool because there were all these photographs and images that existed of her. She had a reputation in the theater, you know, a somewhat still scandalous reputation in the theater. There were legends about her and she was executed, but she had a very rough ride through life and her spying, you know, was just the final act of it. Hmm. So but she didn't it, really accomplish anything significant with the espionage. She simply got caught at it then? Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. It was a very, you know, it's kind of a heartbreaking story when you think about it. Um, you know, her default mode was prostitution throughout her life, um, you know, whether high end or low end. But, you know, at the end of her life, she was already broken. She didn't really care if she lived or died at that point. Well, that um, is sad. Yeah, but she was the, you know, how can I put it? She, she was the prototypical femme fatale. Um, a major Colson, British military officer, wrote a sensational book about her, which was turned into a movie with Garbo. And that added to the mythology. Yeah, they'll, they'll do that. The movie adaptations don't really help with the accuracy, but they do yeah. bring a lot of attention to the story. Yeah, so. and it was a it was a big budget movie at the time. It had costumes by Adrian and, you know, a lot of, you know, hoopla surrounded it because it was Garbo. You know, but it's mostly the mythology. Yeah. Okay, I, I can see that certainly. The the legend outlives the truth in in so many cases. How right. how long was her espionage career? Just like a matter of months or something? Yeah, probably. It was under a year, I believe. Under a year. Okay. Yeah, and she was already. I mean, we see the photo of her, and she's I don't know early twenties, I guess, in, in her in her you know costume, the most famous photo. But she was already, I think you said, already in her forties by the time that this. Right espionage began and she was right. just not the person that people imagined for the most part right right she was in middle age all the photos used of her for publicity were the you know publicity photos taken for her act hmm. um, and all and we know her through the you know through those publicity photos but it was a very sad life you know um, as a footnote to that they removed her head after she was shot and it was put into a laboratory museum in paris and in the 2000s, they discovered the head was missing. Oh, my gosh. Head was missing. So so do you think that there's a chance that right now, like, I mean, that's in some person's collection somewhere out there? Yeah, probably. It, com it, it probably completed a collection somewhere. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, they, they didn't remove it haphazard. Those were back in the days when people still believed in phrenology. So they wore the study the bumps on her head. Right. I mean, we call it a pseudoscience now, I guess, but right. they didn't think of it as a pseudoscience at the time. But right. my gosh, that's 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 hard to imagine. That's a that's a very that's a very depressing end to her story. I have to say that yeah. you know she's out there somewhere right now yeah. on a shelf or, or God knows what. Honestly, well, so there was, of course, there's a fair number of stories not only in your book but ahead of it that have happened of the. Uh, men also being used. It wasn't ent entirely femme fatales, of course. So right. I really enjoyed reading about this guy. I think, let me see, it was Bystro Bystroliatov, I think, Dmitry right. Bystroliatov. Right. Um, good looking guy, had a very checkered beginning, not well educated, but, you know, innately intelligent, you know, and he would seduce women. And he was very clever about it, the way he did it. I guess his largest score or his largest operation was all him who was a code breaker or a code person in the UK. And he recruited him who used typical means, it was money. He was from, he married well and his wife's money vanished during the depression, during the stock market crash. So he ran Oldham as a typical case officer would, handler would, and then seduced the wife. And so he had a spy spying on his spy. <laughs> Boy, the guy was thorough. Pardon? He was thorough at his job. He was, he was thorough. So, you know, the wife would spy on her husband who was, you know, and he had no idea, but he was just delivering documents to the, um, you know, to his handler. He had no idea that he was being watched by his wife as well as his handler. My gosh. Yeah, it really is a wilderness of mirrors, as they say, isn't yeah. it? Um, 
he, he did manage to get the wife, I think, a small pension, which he, after, you know, the operation ended, but I think she committed suicide soon after. Really? Really? Yeah. I mean, that's what happened to them. I mean, did, was Oldham eventually arrested by British authorities or, or suicide? Suicide. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah. He was found at home. Okay. I'm remembering right. that now he was found at home in his kitchen, I think. Right. Right. And the wife um, died as well. Yeah. Yeah. The wife died a few years later. Oh, boy. And what about Beethoven himself? Did he make it back to the Soviet Union or was he arrested? He made it back to the Soviet Union, became a victim of the purges, was sent to a gulag, remarkably survived, got out and made a living as a translator and an artist afterwards. Oh, wow. Um, Surviving the gulag, that might've been his most impressive accomplishment, honestly. Right. He wrote a very long autobiography, which they haven't released in full. A heavily edited version has been released. Hmm. Um, yeah. No, I, no. Didn't you say the manuscript was like thousands of pages long or, or something or believed to be? Yeah. yeah. You know, no, intelligence agencies don't like to admit that they employ honey traps. It's amazing. Uh, you know, they'll admit to audio surveillance, clandestine audio surveillance. They'll admit to bribery. They'll admit to satellites. They'll admit to phone taps. But they become very squeamish if you talk about honey traps. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Any particular reason? I mean, just because we all feel like such a personal sense of betrayal at the idea of that or some other thing? Yeah, I think there's an unseemliness about them, you know, that, that they view, you know, that they're unseemly, that they're somehow, you know, beneath the dignity of, you know, the, the espionage trade. Hmm. But they all virtually use them. It's like the small town brothel on Saturday night. And, you know, people were rail against it all week, but it's, you know, it's always full on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, that's true. That's a, a fairly main, a mainstay of the, of the gray economy, I guess you could say. So, so since we're already on the topic of the Soviets, I mean, I know that they were, uh, appear to be just very, very good at having the run of the U.S. embassy, especially in the early years of you know, Soviet American relations. So what happened there at, with the, the first few years of U.S. embassy or U.S. government per, per, presence in Moscow? The idea was, um, the first ambassador had the idea that we should, you know, build goodwill, you know, with the Soviets by not having any kind of real security or not being suspicious of them. And they launched an offensive with ballerinas and, you know, all kinds of things. And it was just a, you know, it's kind of like, you know, my impression from reading the material, it was somewhat like Animal House for a while. Um, <laughs> um, once they, you know, in, in th they were the first embassy to request it of a contingent of Marines. The Marines were stationed in a hotel while the embassy was being prepared for them. And someone at the hotel noticed a large number of very good looking women, you know, identifying themselves as Russian tutors going up to visit the Marines. And eventually they, it became too much. They, you know, the, the embassy had to actually print cards saying that your room might, is probably bugged and that your belongings will probably be searched act accordingly, you know, for visitors. And they, you know, they managed to institute some security, but it was always a problem throughout, you know, you know, the, the mission to Moscow you know, the U.S. mission and other, you know, and other embassies as well. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's a timeless problem like we've been talking right. about. You know, I, Henry, I love the phrase that you just used a minute ago. They launched an offensive with ballerinas. That's right. a brand new sentence probably, but that, that captures it so, so perfectly. Yeah. Honestly, uh, because it was a strategy employing the, the least people, the last people you'd suspect, and it worked perfectly. Yeah. You know, um, at one point there was a highly publicized affair between the American ambassador and the ballerina, uh, you know. Right. I think, wasn't he, he and another guy at the embassy, weren't they feuding? Do I remember that correctly? Because they were both in love with the same woman who was obviously, you know, manipulating both. Uh, Ambassador Bullitt was having an affair with the ballerina, but he was also, had, was close to our secretary, Miss Lahan, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. These guys should all absolutely have known better and they're just so easily, you know, knocked off their feet by the, the most obvious thing in the world. And it still works, you know, yeah. practically every time. It's amazing. Well, we don't know how often it doesn't work. Good point. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Some people I'm sure report, you know, when someone approaches them like that, or they just give them the brush off or something like that. But yeah. it's certainly been effective plenty of times in the course of history as you've documented. Yeah. So that was pre-World War II. Was, this was the 1930s, I think, was when this was right. occurring. 
This was in the lead up to the war. Okay, yeah. During the war, there was this Nazi brothel that you talk about called Salon Kitty, I think. Right. Um, that that was quite an operation, it sounds like. Can you discuss that a little? It was pretty short-lived. It was a brothel where the rooms were allegedly bugged. And the girls were interviewed, you know, on a frequent basis. The girls didn't know the rooms were bugged, so the interviews and the reports had to coincide with the recordings that were made. It was damaged in a bombing, but it it got traction like Mata Hari through a movie in the 70s, a Nazi exploitation movie called Salon Kitty. Uh, made by Tinto, a very stylish thing. And it's said to be the first Nazi exploitation movie following the war. Well, I haven't even seen it yet, but I can, I can just imagine what the movie poster for that would look like, though. Interestingly, and I can send it to you, the poster in Germany has no Nazi regalia on it. It has a naked woman on it, but no Nazi <laughs> regalia. Okay. Because, because it was illegal to use Nazi symbols oh, for, of course. For, for promotional purposes. Right, right. That makes sense. <laughs> right. In America, it had a plenty of Nazi regalia, you know, plenty of Nazi symbols. So the poster in Germany and the poster outside of Germany are vastly different. I'll bet. I'll bet. So who were, who were the intended targets for this? I mean, were, it was mostly like Nazi Party members, I would imagine, that were frequent, Nazi Party right? members and access, high level access. People. Okay, so who was listening in on them? Was it just like his, Hitler's trusted people were listening in on the recordings or, or what? Or counter espionage people? Counter espionage people were listening in for gossip. I believe one of Mussolini's, you know, people were involved in it. You know, all of the recordings disappeared immediately after the war when the Russians went in. We don't know if the Russians scooped them up or if they were, or if they were destroyed by the Germans. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I, I can see it going either way, but I'm sure the Russians would have absolutely loved to get their hands on that. They were very good at, you know, turning people in the in the occupied zone and all that right. uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war. Right. It was, you know, it it, it it was a very upscale operation, as they say, you know, the best food and the best wine, right, even in times of shortages. That's um, mm -hmm. that that seems to be one of the hallmarks of an intelligence operation. Um, dating back to the, you know, go back to the American Revolution. Stores that were, you know, uh, uh, catering to the British troops always seemed to have, you know, thing, you know, items that were in short supply everywhere else. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. You want to make it a, a, a desirable place for a lot of people to, sure. to come in if you have some, you know, other intentions right. there. So I also love this story about this woman, Amy Thorpe. It was her code name Cynthia? I right. think that was a really, just a thrilling Amy, story. Sounded right out of a movie, honestly. Right. Amy Thorpe, she was an American from Wisconsin, married a British diplomat, and was well aware, you know, was well accustomed to Washington society. And she was jointly run by British and American intelligence. And she was able to get the code books out of France, you know, out of the French embassy. According to one legend, she, you know, targeted a French diplomat and went into the offices of the embassy and took off all of her clothes except for high heels and a pearl necklace so that if the guard walked in he would see them you know he would think it was a tryst and not an intelligence operation they broke into the safe handed the code books to someone waiting right outside they were photographed and returned to the safe wow yeah that, that's amazing stuff so they were able to get the codes out of the embassy and she was the lead of the operation, but also had the perfect distraction, I guess, really, and the perfect deflection for what their true purpose was there. Right. Yeah. You know, she was you know, naked in disguise, you could say. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's impressive stuff. Did she, that's the only story I've ever personally heard of her, but did, was, did she work in other ways as well? Did she have a, a longer career besides that? No, that was pretty much it. She, be, she was recruited by the Brits when she picked up some pillow talk and, you know, with one of her affairs, you know, recreational affairs, I believe. And uh, then they took it from there. Her husband, I don't think, had much interest in her. Um, you know, you know, after a certain point. Um, hmm. But but she but she was already known to have affairs, and she was already known to be very very social. She was able to you know operate in this you know high society of Washington, so she was perfectly suited for the job. Hmm. I see. I see. Yeah, she sounds like an amazing person. Yeah, she um, married, eventually she married one of her targets and moved to France. 
and live there. Oh, wow. Wow. I wonder if her, if her superiors saw that one coming. Yeah. That's always a, that's always a possibility, isn't it? I mean, these people do occasionally, you know, develop real feelings. Do you think that's a, a frequent thing or is it just, is it more rare? I think it's more rare. I think for most of them, it's a job. Yeah, I can see that if you, if you see a person as a, a target or an asset from the beginning, it might be hard to see them as, yeah. you know, a potential, like a, see a potential future with them, you know, yeah. from the way things are starting out, I can see that, but I, obviously it does happen a little bit at least. Yeah. Well, it happened at least in that one instance. Yep. So, you know, I typically discuss the cold war more than anything else on this podcast, which shouldn't be a surprise. And there were tons and tons of these types of operations throughout that period. Do you have any particular one that was your favorite or the most impressive at all from the cold war period? Oh boy. No, they all kind of have their own special qualities, you know, that make them stand out. I, you know, you know, the stuff that was going on in Russia with Lone Tree, Clayton Lone Tree, he was the Marine. Yes. Yes. You know, that will break your heart. He yeah, he, he was a hard luck guy, no doubt about it. He was a hard luck guy. He didn't stand a chance. They, you know, they created the relationship and it precisely mimicked a real relationship, right? He thought that this woman was very much in love with him as he was with her. Up until his trial, he believed that he had a real relationship with her. That will break your heart. You know, there was a meeting on the subway. There was a walking her home. There was, you know, a lot of espionage mimics normality. And they did it to perfection in his case. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very familiar with his story, but can you just talk about a little bit more about what happened to him for those that might be hearing about it for the first time right now? Right. She was an employee, a Russian employee at the U S embassy. He was a Marine. They had known each other, but you know, being around, she met him on the subway platform, the train platform one night, they talked, they met again and talked more and he walked her home. And the relationship progressed as, you know, any normal relationship would. They were building a new embassy at the time, the U.S., and upstate. he was supposedly give her, you know, vital information or inter scare quotes around uncle. And uncle began requesting things that, you know, his relationship or her, you know, him, him seeing her was dependent on providing information. Eventually, he came, stood trial, and went to prison. But, you know, even at, at his trial, he broke down. And, you know, began crying so that thought she really loved me. You know, that'll break your heart. It's kind of like watching the New York Yankees play a little league team. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah, I've, I've read about him and he had a tough, tough life growing up. I think he was Native American, grew up on a reservation, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah very naive, I'm, you know, uh, not very worldly, you know. And she was this beautiful, you know, woman who kept saying, don't forget about me when you leave. And, you know, I think you're just, you I mean, she, she, she put him on the defensive, I mm -hmm. guess, you know, you know, you know, he kept saying that, you know, I think you're going to forget about me when you leave. I don't think you really love me. You're confusing me. And he had to prove that he, you know, that he did. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, he, he committed a lot of crimes, but they certainly picked the right mark in that case. And from what I recall reading, not, not in your book, but in a different book a while back, he never should have been in that position in the first place. He was not a very you know, very capable yeah. Marine. He was a marginal performer in basically all ways. And he somehow kind of stumbled into that coveted position, you know, that key, you know, became the weak link in the chain, so to speak. Well, they were going after a lot of them, you know, a lot of the Marines. Oh, sure. Back then were partying and having sex with these women. He was the one that they, you know, that they reeled in. Yeah. So how many, how long did he go to prison for? I think he's off the radar now. I think he's been out of prison for a while, but. He's been out of prison. I don't know. I think his sentence was commuted at some point. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. I'm not sure, but it's a very sad story because, you know, he was, you know, it, it, it wasn't as if he was an arrogant guy, like some of them. He was just this naive kid. Yeah. A lot of people get caught up in this and they, they don't realize what's going on until it's too late. And, you know, certainly they, they did the wrong thing and they were cognizant of it, but it, it is easy to be empathetic toward some of the people that come up in these kind of stories. Yeah. He was, you know, it, it always starts with them with, you know, give me something of unimportance, right? Yep. Phone directory or, you know, what, you know, when, where's this guy's office or something like that. And then it will be a step process of, of, you know, requesting material of more and more importance more and you know more with more intelligence ambition i guess or more ambitious material yep yep 
Yeah, I mean, they're smart about it. They've, they've been playing that game for a long time, so they just got to yeah. you know, bide their time, and they will find somebody who will, who will be susceptible to all that. Right, and, you know, they'll do their homework. And I, I think that's a large part of honey traffic, doing your homework on the individual on the target. Right, right, absolutely. So, Henry, probably the most famous similar operation from this century so far would be Anna Chapman from the, the Russian 10 in New York City. And you devote quite a bit of space in the book to that. So can you talk about how her own, you know, behavior kind of mimicked these previous operations? Yeah, I don't think, I think that she's been largely misunderstood, to tell you the truth. Her father was likely, very likely, an intelligence officer. Um, so she grew up in that world. She was in Africa and Zimbabwe. You know, they make, <laughs> she's largely made out to be a sex pot, you know, or a femme. I interviewed people that knew her back in New York. And she did nothing to raise eyebrows in New York. You know, it's a fast crowd. You know, she was in the club crowd. It's a fast crowd. She wasn't the fastest in that crowd, hmm. right? The, um, the slut shaming after they, you know, bust one of these people, you know, after they arrest them is a long tradition, right? Going back to Matahari, right? Um, yeah, exactly. But, Absolutely. Right. But, you know, she was pretty typical of that club crowd. She blended right in. She used clubs. Since her time in Zimbabwe, that's how she got to England, by dating a DJ. And a British DJ who was guest, you know, working a club in Zimbabwe. And, you know, that's how she got to England. And in New York, she used clubs. And she was very smart about it. She just didn't walk in. I don't know if you, are you familiar with nightclubs in New York? The nightclub scene in New York at all? Uh, not really. I've, I've never been in one. Okay. There anyway. Uh, there's a hierarchy. And it's always existed in nightclubs in New York. Right. You know, you can get in and you can sit at the bar. Right. And that's, you know, that's fine. You're inside. But there are VIP sections. And the VIP sections are very closely guarded by club personnel. These are big tables. These are tables that will spend between ten and eighty thousand dollars a night. Oh wow. All right. That's what good money for a club. And the club promoters bring these tables in. And a lot of times they're, you know, 35 or 40 year old guys just divorced, don't know what's going on, you know, but want to go out to the clubs, you know, because maybe they've missed their youth or something, or they want to really capture some of their youth. And they've got enough money to spend to, you know, at these nightclubs. And the club promoter will be kind of their concierge in these clubs. And in return, the promoters get a kickback from the clubs if you bring in a fifty thousand dollar table the club promoter will give you some money for it. so immediately she attached herself to club promoters who could get her beyond the bar you know the velvet ropes beyond the velvet ropes i guess you could say i see, so I see. she was very smart the way she went about it in one instance she approached a club promoter you know outside of the club when he was all when he was so you know it was a very disciplined intelligence operation it wasn't, you know, her run, you know, it wasn't spring break for her in Cancun. So she used these contacts that she made there to kind of leverage her way up towards better, I don't know, better targets, better contacts along the way? Yeah. You know, she used the, you know, she made friends with the club promoters. The club promoters got her and in, introduced her to the guys in the VIP section. And she was able to target, you know, high flying lawyers and things like that when one in particular did that yeah. kind of did that bear fruit i mean did she get where she needed to be for her operation at that point because i know uh, that there's they had like kind of a mixed tracks rec record of success that whole yeah that whole... well she was under surveillance the whole time she was here I guess. Oh, okay right so um you know it wouldn't have borne fruit i got it I got it. <laughs> but you know potentially it could have again she was very smart about the way she went about it you know, and she did the same thing in England. When she was in England, she also, you know, targeted, you know, club management, right? Mm -hmm. And people that worked there. So she was always an insider at some point in these places. Um, okay. So did most of her, I don't know if I call it her, her perceived reputation, did that just come because she was such an attractive woman and she was in the news so much after the, after the arrests? Yeah, she was, you know, I, I guess she had, you know, a, a couple of affairs, you know, while she was in New York and in, you know, London. 
but you know, again, you know, she, you know, she wasn't going out every night and you know taking a guy home. She was, you know, these are very targeted things if they weren't recreational. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah that was a, a pretty smart operation, except for yeah. being burned from the beginning. Yeah, it's you know, it's a fast crowd. I don't know how well it translates to Middle America, or, you know, outside of New York City. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's very true. That's unrelatable to some people, I guess, but it made sense yeah. in that in that time and place. In, in that time and place, it made perfect sense. Yeah. I got you. Um, you know, places like the Greenhouse, or you know, one of those clubs, you know, filled with house music and EDM, and all that stuff. It, was, you know, it makes perfect sense. Okay, okay, I've got it. So, Henry, now that we're we're in present day now, and of course, and looking, you know, right now and in, towards the near future. How has all of this changed over the past few decades, you know, of the, the information age and the end of the Cold War and, and that sort of thing? I mean, are these tactics still as, as timeless as ever, or are they, you know, being used in different ways now? The, the, the original tactics going back to, you know, the Sanskrit and Samson and Delilah um, are still being used. If something works, it's never not used. Does that make sense? If, oh, if absolutely. It works, if it works, it never falls out of fashion. Um, what happens is that they add things, right? So right now you've got dating apps, you've got an online, you know, you have, you have an online world to exploit. There was, you know, an instance in the Middle East where they were, you know, targeting soldiers and the, and the supposed women on the other end of the line said, I want to send you some pictures that I'm very shy about, or, you know, per, very, some very personal pictures. Can you download this app to decrypt them? And the app was actually on the Apple store. And the, the, the soldiers would try to download the app and it would say not accessible. Or, you know, it would reject it. In reality, the app had taken over their telephone, every oh, function wow. of their cell phone. So it had the GPS, it had the microphone, it had the photo. It had access to all of the data on their phone and where they were. And that's a hugely valuable thing, you know, to tap into, you know, several military personnel with that. Right. Mm -hmm. They can do the same thing on uh, social media sites like Twitter. They make friends and, you know, all of a sudden there's a problem, you know, the person on the other end will say, you know, I'm having trouble, you know, doing this kind of, you know, difficult software project. Can you look at it for me? And they'll open a file and all of a sudden all of their files become, you know, open or yep. accessible to the other person. Yep. Um, the person who doesn't get a lot of credit, I've got to say in this, is Marcus Wolf. And he may be actually my one of my favorite, you know, honey trap operations. He ran Romeo spies targeting Western West German women. Yeah, I've I've read quite a bit about him and and them as well. That was some incredible operations, and just, I mean, he had such long term success out of that because he ran some of those women for like 10, 15 years or more. I mean, it was right. only the end of the Cold War that really brought it into those operations. Yeah, what he did though, is his genius was in rec recognizing a demographic anomaly. And that was at following World War II, there was a shortage of men in Germany for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, that meant that women were anxious to, it was difficult for women to find long-term relationships but also that women were filling the roles previously held by men in government offices. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important second point there for sure. Right. So he recognized this early on and that's when he launched his Romeo spy, you know, offensive. And these operations went on for years, some of them, you know, more than a decade. In one instance, you know, the woman was feeling bad about, you know, spying. And they arranged to have a staff officer pose as a priest and take confession. <laughs> right? And oh my gosh. The, the priest said, well, you know, it's not the, you know, it's not, it's not a great thing that you're spying, but, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world either. And the woman was able to overcome her, you know, um, or overcome her hesitancy, you know, with that. Oh, my gosh. That, that's an incredible level of... What's the word on backstopping? I guess I mean it's just that's that's amazing that he could arrange all of that and just continue to manipulate this person from start to finish, just have them, you know, read up and down all to keep that operation going. Yeah, you no, know, she was she was in an important place in intelligence, West German intelligence. 
And the one, uh, they, they often came across in the false flags. They were saying, I'm from Denmark, I'm from Sweden, that kind of thing. Oh, okay, yeah. So, they, they, you know, they didn't present themselves as Stasi. They said, you know, I'm from Denmark, we're a poor country, and NATO isn't sharing, you know, maybe you can help me out. Yeah, there's. I know there's a couple. I, I'm somewhat familiar with the one you just mentioned. I'd heard that somewhere. I, well, I'm sure I read it in your book as well, of course. And there was, um, was it Gabriel Gast, I think, was one of the best known West right. German women. Oh, it went on for years. And, you know, incredibly, you well, know, not incredibly, but, you know, typically these guys weren't really handsome. They were just, you know, they were just guys, right? You know, if you brought George Clooney in there or something, you know, they would have attracted suspicion. These were just average looking guys. What do you think then was the was the quality that in that man, in that actor, that Romeo, that created this level of loyalty where these women would, you know, betray their government for years on end? I mean, what was it that these how did he select these guys, I guess is is what I should be saying. Um, I think they were Stasi officers. He he was very vague about it in his memoirs, very cagey. I suspect they were just highly disciplined guys, you know, and they were, you know, that was known from being already being a Stasi officer. The one with Gast, I believe, wanted to back out at several points. He wanted a life, and, you know, they told him no. Hmm. Yeah, too important for the mission, I guess, for the yeah. uh, agent. Yeah. Um, another one would be Mercada. That, you know, Mercada, the um, Trotsky assassin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, he, in order to get access to the Trotsky compound. That's right. This was back in, was it 1937, was it? Was it am I got that right? In uh, Mexico? No, I think it was, it was in Mexico. I think it was a little later, but you know, he posed as a Belgian playboy. You know, yeah, yeah. And his, I think I recall his mother was involved in that operation as well. It's like mother and son were part of the same mission right. to get Trotsky. Right? That's incredible. Right. And the mother had been seduced by the handler. So, uh, <laughs> boy, yes, yeah, wheels so, within wheels here. Right. So it was a it was a double honey trap. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff, really. So I have to ask, Henry, in, in terms of all the different ways that you can get to a person, you know, manipulate them, like, you know, bribery, you know, financial concerns, or, you know, whether they're a, a willing volunteer because of their ideology or whatever, how do you personally rank, you know, sex and love and that sort of thing with the, against the other levers that are used against a potential target or a potential mark? I think it depends on the person that the target. I, I think it depends on the target. Um, oh yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, right. some people would be immune to one or the others, or or maybe right. all but one. But you can get them somehow, some way. Yeah, you know, everyone has some weakness, or everyone has some, you know. So it would be money or sex. It, it's like asking what's more important, money or sex. Right. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Well, what? How about this then? What about what fraction of intelligence operations involve some aspect of of a honey trap? Do you think? I mean, is that like a uh, you know, 20%, 5%, you know, something like any thoughts at all after all the research that you've done on that? Let me do this unrelated thought, okay? Okay. Because it's, it, it's really important to get this. When you talk about women in intelligence in general, in the history of women in intelligence, only a very small percentage have been used as honey traps. Um, oh, certainly, yeah. Right. And I think that's a misconception that people do, or, or I think that's something that people really have to realize. So, you know, women have played a huge role in intelligence and everything from case officer to photo analysis, you know, to analyst, right? Only a very, very small percentage of them at any given time are used in that respect. And many of the ones that are used come from outside of the intelligence community. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. They're not suited for other roles, I guess. So they're kind of recruited separately from that. But yeah, you're right. We've I've done a number of episodes about women in intelligence, and this is the first time that you know in what this is 58th episode, I think, or 59th episode. This is the first time we've discussed this because it's not the most common thing in the world. Although of course it does happen. Yeah, only a very in all of history, only a very small percentage of them use this honey. Yeah, trap. absolutely, um, absolutely. Right, and I, I think that's really important to get across that this is a very particular kind of a, you know operation, mm -hmm. and it, you know it's um, it, it's you know you shouldn't paint an entire gender, I guess, uh, you know, in you know in, in a profession with it. Yeah, absolutely. 
And that's why I'm glad that you also covered, you know, the Romeo spies and some of the other people, because it's not, you know, just men that have been manipulated by women. That's a, that's an incredibly simplistic and inaccurate, you know, a portrayal. Although that is certainly what you see the most in, you know, fictional portrayals as well. Right. And they're also, you know, gay honey traps, John Basswell being the most, you know, famous. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Right. There, were, there were quite a few of them actually in the book. Right. What's not in the book, and I should have put it in there, is Bobby Ray Inman, as late as 1980, refused to um, dismiss or revoke a security clearance from a gay official or a gay officer at NSA. Hmm. As late and, as 1980. That, yeah. And that was at a time when being gay would immediately, you know, cause a revocation of you know, security clearance. Right. Yeah. That, that's come up in my research a few times. And that just provides, when you do it like that, you provide yet another lever to the adversary in a way, because you've got people that are now, you know, maybe patriotic, hardworking, you know, true believers, but they also have a big aspect of their life that they have to hide professionally and personally. Right. And, and that provides another, another lever for manipulation, you know, to Soviets or whoever it might be. A, a lever of manipulation or a lever of just elimination from that position, right? Mm -hmm. If you out somebody back in the 70s or the 60s, somebody who is very, very good at their job, say an analyst, you hurt the entire organization, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I think that was used. I, I, I don't have a documented case of it, but I believe that that was one of the techniques that was used during the Cold War. They would out somebody in order to hurt an organization. You know, that, that makes perfect sense. And I, I certainly wouldn't put it past them because why wouldn't you, you know, take advantage of that if you have the ability? Yeah. Wow. So Henry, one last question here for you, you know, because we've been talking about how fictional portrayals are often very inaccurate. Is there anything you can point to in the world of fiction that you're like, actually, that's, that's pretty good. Anything if my listeners want to, you know, find something to, to watch or read or whatever that's fictional? On honey traps. Yes. No, I really, you know, I really can't think of a really good portrayal off the top of my head. It's quite an indictment of Hollywood there, unfortunately. It's, well, it's, you know, it's Hollywood, right? Right, right. Exactly. You know, I love some spy, you know, spy movies, but they're totally unrealistic. You know, yeah. I don't watch a lot of them. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's an indictment of me, too. I don't watch a lot of spy movies. Yeah, I'm I kind do. of the same way. I'm a little bit tired. Of, I don't know if I'd say tired of it, but, you know, I'm ready to turn that part of my brain off once I'm done with a lot of, you know, historic research. I don't want to kind of watch the same thing to yeah. unwind afterwards. Yeah, I did like Red and Red 2 with Bruce Willis. Red State? <laughs> red. It's oh, red. red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was fun. I, did, I do remember yeah. that one years ago. Yeah, they were fun. I like them in their light. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the heavy, heavy. I thought that the new... Oh, wait a minute. Here's one. Romeo Spy, the new Tinker Tailor. Romeo Spy? It's, I haven't heard of that one, I don't think. No, no, no. There's a Romeo Spy and the new Tinker Tailor in, in Tinker Tailor. Okay, okay. Is that the one with Gary Oldman in it? Yeah, Gary yeah, Oldman, Ricky Tarr. Okay. Ricky, Ricky Tarr acts as a Romeo spy, right? Okay, yeah, you know, I think I'm remembering that. I haven't seen that one in several years. I, I need to rewatch yeah. it, certainly, because it's such a classic, but I, I think I do recall that. Yeah, Ricky Tarr acts, acts as a Romeo spy, and that's brought out. I think more than the of Alec Guinness, but I'm not sure. So, you know, I think that's pretty accurate. Okay, yeah, I'm going to have to rewatch that in that case. It's been a while. Yeah, he, he actually falls for his target, which is the wife of a, a Russian diplomat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that'll do it. So maybe that one you know, works. But okay, you know, off yeah. the top of my head, I can't think of anything realistic. Why would it begs the question? Why would you want to do a realistic Hollywood movie? <laughs> yeah, they, they have so much of real work is a lot more slow paced than what people have come to expect from spy films. That's for sure. Yeah, it's slow paced, and it's not very you know it's not very action packed. Right, right, right. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with the way that Hollywood does spy movies. I guess, you know, you know, they work their side of the street. I'll work mine. Mm, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it for sure. Well, Henry, this has been really informative. I really appreciate it. The, the book is called Honey Trapped. And like I said, it's, it's jam packed full of amazing stories, many of which I was not familiar with. And we've covered you know, less than 10%, certainly, maybe maybe 7 or 8% of what's in the book in the past hour or so here. So if you're enjoying these kind of stories, you're going to find an awful lot more of those in Honey Trap. So make sure you grab a copy yourself. I, I really enjoyed it. Henry, are you working on another book already? Or are you doing something else at the moment? I'm researching, I'm researching a book that I, you know, I'd like to sell in the future. I'm not, I'm not quite ready to talk about it yet.
Okay. Yeah, that's uh, I've had several people tell me that and I, I totally don't blame them for that at all. But everything that you've written so far, I really enjoyed. So I look forward to whatever is coming next from you. Oh. Oh, thank you. Is there anywhere, do you have like a public facing social media or anything like that, that, you know, people can connect with you if they want to? Spies and Vespers on Twitter. Spies and Vespers on Twitter. Yes, yes, that's right. I've been following you for a while now. That's a pretty big account too. I think you've got quite a few followers there as well and you post pretty frequently. Yeah, I post espionage history every day. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I've been following for a while. That's a great one. Spies and Vespers yeah. on Twitter uh, right. for anybody who's looking for it. And if you can figure out what the handle means, then you'll get a bonus. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Henry. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for okay. um, coming on. No problem. Um, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.